And that's the problem, a problem we know well from our computer world. And that is that the functional sequences are so rare that if you begin to change the, the, the bit strings, you're inevitably, after very few changes, going to destroy the function long before you ever get to something new or functional. Today, we'll be diving into some fascinating ideas about the DNA. We'll explore insights from Stephen Meyer and discuss how modern science might be unintentionally pointing to an intelligent source behind it all. So one of the major discoveries of the 20th century in biology was the discovery of the structure of the DNA molecule or the elucidation of the structure of the DNA molecule. And that occurred in 1953 when Watson and Crick determined that the DNA had a double helix structure, along the inside of which were these four chemical subunits called bases or nucleotide bases. And then four years later, Crick took that discovery one step further and realized that those, those chemical subunits on the inside of the molecule were functioning just like alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters like the zeros and ones we use in software. In other words, it wasn't the structure of those, the chemical structure of those subunits or their molecular weight or their shape that mattered. What mattered was their arrangement in accord with an independent code that was later discovered called the genetic code. So inside the DNA molecule, what we have is literally information or instructions inscribed digitally or alphabetically, typographically, in a way that provides the information that's necessary to build the important proteins and protein machines that keep all cells alive. So this is a stop press moment in the history of biology. Uh, people have wondered for centuries, why does like beget like? And at least in the case of why we get new proteins that are like the old proteins, the, question, or the answer is the DNA contains the information for building them, and that's what keeps living cells alive. So DNA is akin to a blueprint or a computer program. It contains instructions written in a special code, a language of its own that directs the building of proteins and other essential machinery in our cells. Just like a software that runs on a computer, DNA operates in our bodies. And this code has a clear source, that is information. Watson and Crick elucidate the structure of DNA in 1953. It's a pretty big discovery, very big breakthrough. But in 1958, uh, Francis Crick, working on his own, it's interesting, he'd been a code breaker in World War II. And he's working on his own and he realizes that along the spine of the DNA molecule, on the interior of that famed double helix, there are a series of chemical subunits. And he realizes that those chemical subunits, they're called bases or nucleotide bases, are functioning like alphabetic characters in a written language or like digital characters, like the zeros and ones in a, in a section of the machine code. And he's making these discoveries about the same time that you're having the information revolution taking place in engineering and math and physics. And so you have the, the concepts of information coming into the sciences. And George Gamow, a very famous physicist, realizes that Crick's description of the, the DNA molecule can be rendered that what he's describing with the, the, the function of the, the nucleotide bases, he says that a series of those bases can be rendered as a digital bit string. This is a, a string of information for directing, and this was Crick's hypothesis, for directing the construction of proteins and protein machines that keep cells alive. So by the mid-1960s, when this sequence hypothesis of, Watson, uh, of Francis Crick is confirmed, you, biology enters an information age, and people realize that inside the cell, we don't just have chemical reactions going on. It's not just metabolism, even. Mm -hmm. It's it's an information storage, transmission, and processing system. Yeah. And if there's two different processing systems inside the cell, one for replicating DNA and one for using the information in DNA to direct the construction of proteins. And so the, the sophistication of the informational system that's at work inside even the simplest cell, even one cell bacteria have information processing and storage capacity of the type I'm describing. This, this completely changes the terms of debate about the origin of life and even, even uh, evolutionary biology, because we now realize that in order to build uh, the first living cell, and in order to build new life from pre-existing life, in each case, you have to have information. Just as in our computer world, you need code to produce uh, to, to, if you want to give your computer a new function, if you want to have a new app or a new program or a new operating system, you've got to provide information. Same thing turns out to be true in life. If you want to build a new form of life from a simpler pre-existing form, or if you want to build life in the first place, you've got to have information to build the proteins and the molecular machines and the other structures inside the cell. And so that's that creates a shift. It, it puts ev all evolutionary theories under pressure. Uh, I would say that, that both chemical and biological evolutionary theory have reached a state of impasse because they cannot explain the origin of information. And yet we know from experience that information always arises from a known source, and that source is intelligence. Now, Watson and Crick's discovery of the double helix structure in 1953 was groundbreaking, but it was Francis Crick's later work that introduced the concept of information in biology. Stephen Meyer, in one of his older videos, explains this brilliantly. He said that, imagine a Boeing engineer writing code for a machine to place rivets perfectly on a plane. Similarly, in a cell, DNA directs the construction of essential proteins. That's information at work, 
a purposeful intelligent system at the heart of life. The information age in biology has shown that life isn't just chemistry but information system, one that points to an intelligent source behind it. Stephen Meyer also argues that information, by its very nature, comes from a mind. Now to understand this, let's dive a little deeper into the relationship between information and constraints. So the universe is full of possibilities for how matter can be arranged. But for life to exist, specific constraints need to be applied to limit these possibilities and create functional outcomes. Take something as simple as flipping a coin when it lands on heads. The possibility of tails is eliminated. That elimination represents a bit of information. In the same way, DNA stores and transmits information by selecting one of four possible nucleotide bases at each site. This selection, this constraint, guides the construction of proteins, the building blocks of life. Even processes like natural selection, which Darwinists claim are random, involve constraints. Think about it. Selection already implies something is being chosen or guided. It's not truly random. It's constrained by the rules of survival, environment, and fitness. In this way, the organization of life mirrors how mind operates by imposing order and purpose on matter. This raises an intriguing question. What if mind isn't just something found in humans? but is an inherent aspect of the universe itself. A principle that shapes reality from the smallest genetic sequences to the grandest cosmic structures. It's a thought that makes people uneasy, but is very hard to avoid when we see so much purposeful order in nature. But what constitutes a mind? At its core, a mind enables consciousness, thought, perception, and intentionality. It allows us to be aware of our surroundings, make decisions, and experience reality. In humans, this involves complex neural processes but philosophers have long debated whether the mind is purely a product of physical brain activity or if there's something more to it. Could there be a deeper, non-material aspect to the mind that transcends physicality? I think yes. The complexity and purposeful information encoded in DNA, the constraints that guide natural processes, and the very existence of consciousness suggest that the mind is more than just physical interactions. It points to a non-material dimension that influences the material world a fundamental aspect of reality that we're only beginning to understand. And see, in the 19th century, late 19th century, there was the assumption you could understand everything by reference to matter and energy operating within space and time. And we realized late 20th century, uh, neither in biology nor in physics nor in other fields can you understand what's going on, but especially not in biology can you understand what's going on apart from a third fundamental entity, and that is information. And you're right, information implies, uh, logically it implies a constraining agent, but empirically, we know from our experience that information always comes from an intelligent source. Yeah. Even, by the way, Jonathan, in these origin of life experiments, I don't know if you've seen any of the the uh, videos online of James Tour, the, uh, the um, organic chemist from Rice University, he's been critiquing these guys who do what are called prebiotic simulation experiments. They're trying to simulate how the first cell could have arisen from some kind of prebiotic environment through a series of of chemical, uh, undirected chemical interactions or reactions. And what Tour shows, and which many people working in origin of life research actually know, but don't want to lead with, is that at each step along the way to get the chemicals, the simple chemicals to move in the direction of more complex and biologically relevant chemistry, constraints have to be applied from outside the system by the prebiotic simulator himself i know i know that's hilarious like even okay. if they get to it like even if they would actually do it it means that they've completely constrained everything to be exactly yeah. in the right place for it to happen it's hilarious so, so here's a big question okay if these experiments are simulation experiments what's being simulated if at every step along the way you need an intelligence agent to restrict degrees of chemical freedom to move in a life relevant direction what are you simulating must have occurred on the early earth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The same thing, right? That's you right. must have, there must have been a, a intelligence playing a role. So even the prebiotic simulation experiments of the chemical evolutionary theorists are inadvertently reaffirming the principle that it takes intelligence to generate information. Because yeah. every one of those con constraints can be uh, rendered as a quantifiable input of information. So here's something fascinating. Scientists conduct these prebiotic simulation experiments trying to recreate the origins of life by simulating a pre-life Earth. 
but Stephen Meyer points out something ironic. They are inadvertently proving their own bias wrong. At each step, external intelligence is required to guide the process, whether they admit it or not. It even gets more specific than that. There are experiments called ribozyme engineering experiments, where the, 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 there's a particular origin of life theory called the RNA world, where the idea is that the first molecule was an RNA world that stored information and could also act as a catalyst of some kind, kind of like, but not really like a protein. That's the theory. Hmm. And, and so there are experiments trying to develop RNA molecules that have the capacity to copy themselves. But to build RNA molecules that have even a limited capacity to copy themselves, and the best we've been able to do in the lab is get about a, a molecule that can copy about 10% of itself, the ribozyme engineer has to literally engineer the sequence of letters on the RNA molecule, the nucleotide bases, a, a, in a very specific way to get a molecule that has this limited self-replicating capability. Even if scientists manage to create life from non-life in a lab, it would only prove one thing intelligence was necessary. Their simulations are showing that intelligence is needed to constrain the process, guiding it toward life. So what are they really proving? Exactly what they're trying to disprove, that intelligence plays a critical role in the formation of life. This happens in the simulation of the origin of the, or the, the modeling of the origin of the universe by physicists called quantum cosmologists. Uh, they end up postulating a pre-existing mathematical state out of which matter somehow arose. But even with the, the equations that they postulate, they have to manipulate them to get an answer that will indicate that our universe is possible. So the manipulation of the mathematical apparatus involves an imparting of information that's coming from the minds of the physicists. The chemical evolutionary theorists do it and forget that they are the, 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 yeah. the man behind the curtain doing all the important uh, constraints of the chemistry to get things to move in the in the right direction. Um, yeah, so... so uh, Every attempt to explain the origin of interesting aspects of our physical universe, apart from intelligence, ends up inadvertently uh, reaffirming the importance of intelligence and the origin of those features. At this point, the coffin is already buried, but let's just burn the whole cemetery. Even in quantum cosmology, the chemical evolution, intelligence keeps showing up in places we least expect it. Physicists manipulate mathematical equations to explain the universe's origins and chemists tweak their experiments to create life. In both cases, the fingerprints of intelligence are all over the process, reaffirming the central role it plays in the very fabric of life and the universe. Darwinians uh, propose as the, the mechanism by which new form is, uh, is generated. Well, they propose that you will have random changes in the section of a gene, the, the ACs, Gs, and T in a gene, um, and that, some, that many of those random changes will be degraded, but uh, occasionally you'll get lucky and you'll get a good one. And then that, that one will be will result in a new protein and that new protein will result in, uh, will, will combine with other proteins and form, form some sort of anatom new anatomical structure. And as those, those, uh, those um, changes accumulate, you'll eventually get new, new form, new biological form and function. But there's a problem. And that's the problem, a problem we know well from our computer world. And that is that the functional sequences are so rare that if you begin to change the, the, the bit strings, you're inevitably, after very few changes, going to destroy the function long before you ever get to something new or functional. Mm -hmm. If I've got a section of code for building an app and I want to evolve it by random changes to generate a new app, I'm going to degrade and destroy the existing app long before I find a new series of characters that will give me a new app or a new operating system or something. And, and the reason for that is that the, the functional sequences are so rare among all the possible ways of arranging the zeros and ones in computer code. Or we could, think, do, we could do the same thought experiment with English text. If we've got a line of poetry, time and tide wait for no man, and we want to evolve it into a line from the Principia by Newton, uh, we can, we'll start to change the time and tide, and pretty soon we'll get uh, in undecipherable gibberish yeah. long before we get a line from Newton or Hawking or, or anybody else. So, and, and, and What's going on here? We, what's going on is that in all linguistic systems or systems for conveying information digitally or alphabetically, the islands or the, the arrangements that are functional can be represented as little tiny islands separated from other little tiny islands by vast spaces of non-functional gibberish. There's a kind of an abyss between them. Mm -hmm. Now, does that, does that same kind of problem apply in biology? Well, it turns out it does. We have strong uh, empirical evidence now that the sequences that form functional genes capable of building proteins are extremely rare among all the possible ways there are of arranging the ACs, Gs, and Ts in DNA or arranging the amino acids, the 20 amino acids in the proteins. Stephen Meyer makes a great analogy. In software, if you start randomly changing the code, 
you're far more likely to destroy the app than to create something new. The same thing happens in biological systems. Random mutations don't typically result in new functions. They more often destroy existing ones. The functional sequences of DNA are incredibly rare, like tiny islands in a sea of non-functional gibberish. Random chance simply doesn't account for the precise functional information we see in DNA. It points to something greater, something intentional. Information always comes from a mind, as we've seen. Life itself is filled with it. If you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe, and let's keep exploring these deep questions together.